uh, Bill Cotton, the founder and organizer of the Wabakini Project in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Bill, good, great to see you again. It's good to have you back. Here. I had a I had a great week uh, with uh, John Holmes and Bill Pyle and and Andre Witter uh, up in the Rush Bay Lake. And uh, we base camped for an entire week and explored uh, uh, a, a route to Vale Creek and a route down the Collins River. Phil, tell us, where are we at now with the Wabakini Project? Well, you mentioned Rush Bay Lake. It's what I call a pivot lake, where there's more than one route into that lake or out of it. As a matter of fact, Rush Bay is a very important link between Wabakini Provincial Park and Kopka River Provincial Park. And there are no less than four routes in and out of Rush Bay. We did, a few years ago, get to Rush Bay from Wabakimi, but that's as far as we managed to get. So this year the push is on to explore the other routes. You guys did the one east, as you mentioned, to Vail Creek, and started south uh, on Collins River. And right now the people that are up there that replaced you uh, will finish the Collins River all the way down to Kopka River Provincial Park. All right, and this area generally is below the, the rail line, so we could hear the trains uh, from where we were, though we couldn't see them. They were north of us, maybe a mile or something like that. I would say at least a mile, yes. Right. Mind you, sound does carry. So you're working on volume five right now mm -hmm. of the of the there's four volumes currently and volume five is under construction. What kind of progress have we made on volume five? Volume five uh, in our series of map booklets will uh, the subtitle of it will be Lake Nipigon Northern Tributaries and. It includes, it stretches in from the east, the Little Jackfish River, the Picketagushi, Kopka River, and all, anything that flows into Lake Nipigon. In other words, we're working on the Atlantic side of the Continental Divide. Okay, the area of east, northeast, and southeast of Armstrong Station. Yes. On our uh, website, because of the question that you asked, we recently published a PDF map showing the entire Wabakimi area divided it, uh, by the coverage areas of each of the map booklets. Helps people with their purchase of the, to decide which area they are interested in. This year we're running two trips, this uh, right now in the in the late spring, and then there's a little break and then it picks up again, and you've got how many more trips planned? For we have six more trips planned for this summer. Okay. There's a lot of work to be done in terms of interpreting the data you guys collect in the field onto the actual published maps. And your, your hope for plan is that next year is the the last year of the Wabakimi project, which has gone on since is it 2004. 2004. We are incredible. In we are in year 14 right now, and we can see daylight at the end of the tum tunnel. And I've been assured that so that's not the train coming at so us. <laughs> yeah. So next year, you're you're going to kind of bat clean up and go back into other areas and try and address some routes that weren't covered in. In, in, in their entirety in the volumes one, two, three, or four. And so there won't be a volume six, but there are still gaps. On our website, there are some critical maps that uh, people might be interested in. One is uh, a coverage map all the way back to 2004 showing the routes we have done. And each year it gets updated. I'm, I'm pretty confident that with enough um, uh, help from volunteers next year, uh, we, could, we could in fact finish all the loose ends, if you will. And the, and the plan is that the not-for-profit group Friends of Wabakimi will 
kind of carry on into the future in some form uh, the maintenance of the uh, canoe routes that have been established? Not just the maintenance, but the advocacy for their continued protection and preservation. Right. Uh, even uh, as much as uh, monitoring forest management plans and mining plans and development of roads that might impact the canoe roads, that'll be the job of Friends of. This last week uh, on the northeast corner of Rush Bay Lake, a one portage and a po couple ponds in, we're in a very small little lake or pond, if you will, looking for a portage that went into a, the next watershed over the hill towards Vail, Vail Creek. Towards Vail Creek, and it, you showed us a 1908 uh, mining survey map yep. uh, that showed this portage. And when we went in there, we had to look for several hours over a couple of days. Uh, to first of all find what find a trail and they said oh this looks like a trail then as we went along a little bit further we said ah here's a cut log and then another cut log and then we realized we were on the trail and then we worked it back to the pond that we'd started at and found the head of the portage though it was you couldn't possibly have seen that portage from the water because yes, it was the, so overgrown. The shoreline grows in the fastest because yes. it, for two reasons. Uh, the the uh, plant growth, including trees, right. has uh, more water supply along the shoreline, but more importantly, it has more sunlight. So, so then we followed the path over the hill all the way down to what was the correct portage landing and found two blazes on some old large jack pines and the jack pine had grown um, two inches over the over the bulge over the blaze so that indicates an old blaze so somebody had been through there 20 or 30 or 40 years ago and done some cuts the, and um, blazed and blazed it from the Vale Creek end it, that but, could well be um, the history of this part of uh, northwestern Ontario is a mixture of prospectors, trappers, uh, First Nations hunters, gatherers, uh, you know, who would go out and build base camps on a lake like Rush mm -hmm. Bay uh, for their fall hunt. Um, so the traffic that you refer to can go back a long ways, right. an awfully long ways. I was convinced uh, from the get-go that that route out of east, uh, out of Rush Bay to Vail Creek did exist. Finding the maps that you referred to simply confirmed my right, suspicions. Right, that was the historical evidence. That's right. But, that's then, but then our policy says we have to find physical evidence. Right. Um, one of the things that we should impress on uh, on people who view this interview is that we're not in the business of just arbitrarily going out right. there and on a fancy saying, oh, let's cut a trail to this pond. And we have right. to have that historical, historical evidence before we even go in the field right. to, to suss out, you know, and, and see if we can find the right. physical evidence. And the significance of this particular portage was that it, cr it, uh, that it links uh, up an east-west route. Exactly. That exactly. And in, which g offers opportunities to go in several different directions. Right on. In, and back up to that mountain lake where Bill Pyle caught a lake trout a year ago. And, yeah. And uh, on down Lake the Vale Creek through some other lakes to a takeout at, at the road. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a significant find. Very very significant uh, and and a real justification to our persistence of first doing the historical mm -hmm. research before we do the physical research which right. is the in the field right. work and and I and you'll see from other video that we have that you know we went through with the chainsaw and took out some very large birch trees that were covering the trail and lots of obstructions and <laughs>
basically re-cleared that trail. Right. So now it, it is a usable portage path from Vail, from Rush uh, Rush Bay Pond, if you will, yep. over to to Vail Creek. And you know? and uh, what you haven't mentioned is once it's all cleared and we don't cut live trees. Right. What you were describing is what we call deadfall. Um, then we get out the 30 meter tape measure. Correct. And measure it right, right to the nearest foot. And so that was a speak. 676 portage up and over this hill, basically from one watershed to another watershed. Right, right. So the, um, going back to the, speaking of watersheds and going back to the five map booklets that you mentioned, when we first started, we were pulling together these canoe route maps that uh, our map maker Barry Simon had created, but we had no idea how to organize them. And it was by watershed that we decided that each volume uh, would be published. And this volume five that you mentioned is the Lake Nipigon watershed. Right. Uh, we have one that, uh, two of them are the Albany River watershed. Right and the other two are the Ogoki River watershed. Well, back to volume five, it seems to me that one of the real values of volume five is the accessibility because it's up that road. 527. The 527 yeah. highway from Thunder Bay to Armstrong to Station. Armstrong. And so there are numerous uh, of places where you can enter and exit off that highway into the Crown Lands Forest which even though there's a lot of commercial logging going on from the vantage point of the river systems and the lakes it's it is pristine wilderness it is because uh, the the government recognizes canoe routes and their land based attributes like portages campsites and so on as a value right and uh, imposes on the uh, timber companies certain restrictions like buffer zones uh, along the shoreline right? so that the sight line or right. what the government calls viewscapes, viewscapes right. um, is protected and so even though over the top of the hill on Rush Bay where you were last week there is serious cutting has taken yes. place you didn't you see any evidence no, of it didn't. from didn't. anywhere on that lake because yeah. they have to be very careful that they don't even interrupt Right. The horizon line. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the Wabakimi Project participants or any other people that uh, well, may, may happen, happen across this, uh, <laughs> this interview? Uh, well, the gentleman that uh, went in from Michigan to replace you uh, was participant number 201. That's amazing. That's 201 different people. Right. But you have to consider the fact that uh, the two trip leaders that are in there right now, John and Bill, have between them probably over 45 one week trips right. to their credit alone. Right. Um, so I guess my closing words would be a big thank you to all of the different volunteers. And you mentioned Andre, you didn't mention the fact he has come all the way from Switzerland. Amazing, yeah. And brought yeah. some Swiss cheese, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, thank you very much. It's been a powerful experience, and I really appreciate well, it. Well, I hope you're coming back for the I grand finale I next year. I will definitely. would highly encourage people who are interested in the Wabakimi area to uh, contact the Friends of Wabakimi, the Wabakimi Project, uh, Wabakimi Provincial Park, to learn more about uh, what is a world-class uh, canoeing wilderness destination um, which is accessible to many people who if you're tired of the crowds of the boundary waters um, or you've had enough trips in Quetico another great place to check out is the Wabakimi uh, area including Wabakimi Provincial Park um, so signing off Dave McTeague Oregon Dave, uh, see my other trip videos on my Oregon Dave YouTube channel.